Good afternoon and welcome to the League of Women Voters Forum for the 9th Senate District of Illinois. Um, I'm Lolly Watt. I'm the president of the Wilmette League of Women Voters, and this event this afternoon has been organized by the League of Evanston, Glencoe, Glenview, Winnetka Northfield, Kenilworth, and my league, uh, Wilmette. I'd like to thank the Village of Wilmette for allowing us to use their facility and for supporting us in our activities. Uh, the League was formed in the 1920s after the passage of the 19th Amendment to help voters exercise their rights and responsibilities. We work in the area of educating voters, registering voters, improving elections, and improving government, and obviously this candidate forum fits right into the nature of uh, what we are all about. We believe an open governmental system that is representative, accountable, and responsive is necessary for the exercise of a democracy. I'd like to thank the candidates for uh, running for office and for being here this afternoon. Obviously, democracy is not possible without candidates. And I'd like to thank all of you here in the audience and those at home watching. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to introduce Josie Hamilton, who is going to be the moderator this afternoon. She is a past president of the Glenview League. And in keeping with league policy, she uh, does not live in the 9th Senate District. She lives in the 8th Senate District and the 15th House District. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Josie and our uh, candidates. Thank you very much, Lolly. And uh, we are ready now to begin our second debate. As Lolly told you, I do not live in the 9th District. And I'd like to introduce the two candidates who are running for the 9th State Senate District. Mr. Daniel Biss is the Democratic candidate, and Mr. Glenn Fargus is the Republican candidate. The rules are the same as they were for the previous debate. If you have questions that you would like to ask the candidates, please raise your hand and an usher will bring you a blank card. After you have written your question, raise your hand and an usher will come to collect your card. There are league members who will review the questions submitted to avoid duplicate questions so that we can make the most effective use of the time we have available. Oops, there goes. At this time, please turn off all cell phones, pagers, and other electronic devices. Since the purpose of this forum is to give voters the opportunity to hear the candidates express their positions on the issues, please remain silent and in your seats during the forum and do not respond in any audible way until both of the candidates have given their closing statements. Mr. Biss won the coin toss and will begin his opening statement first. And Mr. Farkas will answer the first question first and he will be the first to give his closing remarks. Okay, and um, I could use some questions, please. <clears throat> That's going to be easy, no questions. Yes, and Mr. Biss, could you start your opening statement? You have two minutes. Yes, thank you so much, Josie, for uh, coming to the district and moderating this. Thank you to the League. Thank you to Lolly and all the organizers for putting this together. It's a phenomenal chance to really talk through a lot of important issues. And, and having uh, been to the debate that happened an hour ago, I was so impressed with the diversity of questions that were asked. I used to be a math professor. I didn't really think I'd wind up doing this with myself, got concerned about the direction that our state was going, ran for the state legislature, and became a member of the Illinois House almost two years ago, in January of 2011. And as someone who was a mathematician, found myself, as you might imagine, pretty quickly embroiled in a number of the big fiscal questions that were uh, embroiling state government. I asked immediately to be on two different appropriation committees, the one that writes our elementary and secondary education budget, and the one that writes our higher education budget, as well as the Committee on Pensions and Personnel, which has, of course, been a, a real flashpoint uh, in our state situation. During that time, we've done a few things. We've passed very, very conservative budgets when it comes to discretionary spending, so that we've begun slowly to pay down our very, very long pile of unpaid bills, which is to this day still near $7 billion of unpaid bills. And we've begun a very systematic discussion about pension reform, a discussion that's not always been perfect, a discussion that's been a little bit too name collie and polarized for my taste, but a discussion that has acknowledged that this is an issue whose resolution is required to put the state on a sound fiscal track. In my role on the committee, I've pushed very hard for sustainable solutions that make sense in the long term, that are fair but affordable, 
and that will put the state on a path where we can both afford to pay what we promise, but also simultaneously afford to uh, fund our other priorities. We're nowhere near done. There's an awful lot of work left and very, very tough choices left, but making the correct choices will pay enormous dividends in long-term prosperity and a just society. I'm excited to continue trying to do that, and I hope to earn your support today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Farkas. Hello. Thank you all for coming. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed this week's thrilling discussion on the news about binders. I thought it was really uh, ain't politics grand. That's what I think about whenever I see that. I got home yesterday and I looked on the internet and I, I was reading one of the articles on one of the online newspapers and I, again it was about binders again talking about these issues and it was just started off cutesy and it became really, really um, slanted and biased and just insulting and just to read you one of the words, it was talking about why Mitt Romney's not qualified to be president. He's too smooth, he's too good looking and you know he'll allow women in the workplace. Why not? They look nice. Someone has to make the coffee, right? <laughs> Any one of those smart, qualified women housed in those binders can go fetch lunch. Is that the kind of discussion we want to have? I mean, 30 seconds after I read that article, I was incensed. I wrote a snarky, sarcastic retort back to the writers. And then I thought, you know what, why am I doing that? I just, I, I took the bait and fell right into the trap of going down to the gutter and discussing issues that are absolutely nonsense. So I hope the league and everyone here who's writing questions will Focus like a laser on the really important issues for the state, because we have serious, serious financial issues. One of the reasons I got into the, this race, um, political corruption, collusion, pension and Medicaid funding, and private sector business growth. I grew up in Ohio. I've spent most of my adult life here. Uh, I've got 20 years of experience in the private workforce. Uh, married two kids, live in Glenview. I'd really like to retire here. Um, but the decisions that are going on in this state and the elected leaders are making that decision very tough. And I know over the next 10 to 15 years, when my kids are done with college or in college, we have some serious decisions to make. So I hope uh, you'll enjoy the debate today. Thank you. And Mr. Farkas, I'm going to ask you the first question. Yeah, how strongly do you feel about the fiscal ill health of the state? What specifically would you do to alleviate the problem? Well, as Dan alluded to, I mean, it's, it's kind of simple when you really think about it. Revenues have to be greater than expenses, and for years we haven't done that. We're supposed to have a balanced budget, but every year in this state, the way we do it is we say, okay, we just push it to next year's budget. <laughs> That's the way we balance it. We borrow more money. We rolled over, I don't know, 8 to $9 billion worth of debt into this fiscal year. There really hasn't been a realization that we have to live within our means. I know all of you do it. I have to do it. If we don't have the money, we just don't go out. And I don't ask my clients for more money. I could, but they could leave. So the knee-jerk reaction has been raise taxes. That really hasn't filled any gaps, any holes. It's caused more people to leave. So the, three, the two biggest things that are draining the budget are pensions, Medicaid. They take up half the budget now. They'll be a full 100% within five, seven years. So we don't get those two things right. We're kidding ourselves. If we don't convince more businesses to stay here, reinvest here instead of going other places, We'll never have a chance to generate any kind of tax receipts to cover the, uh, the expenses we have or provide any of the programs that we all care about. Roads, bridges, social programs, nothing. So again, if, in, in, throw in the political corruption. I mean, that's, I've, that's uh, rumored to be a $500 million expense per year. There's all kinds of articles been written about that. Um, I don't know how we can even go forward with any laws we have if the leaders at the top <laughs> don't follow the rules and they play by their own rules and fund their own bank accounts and leave us holding the bag. So again, I hate to be such a, um, a depressing person up here talking about the budget, but I mean, there's really no way else to look at it. We have to make some substantial cuts going forward. Thank you. Um, Mr. Biss, could you answer the same question? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I, I don't blame Mr. Farkas for being depressing talking about the fiscal climate in Illinois. It's depressing. Um, we have done a multi-decade project of just not being honest with ourselves about the cost of the services we want to provide and the rate of taxes we're willing to pay. We've just let those two things diverge, and that's not a reasonable way to run a state government. The three main drivers of that were the growth in our pension cost year to year. I voted on two budgets, and our pension payment grew by almost 20 percent from one budget to the next growth in Medicaid payments year to year, averaging 6 to 7% for the last decade, 
and the growth in our revenue, which is not kept up because of an antiquated, inefficient, and unfair tax system. These things all need to be overhauled. In this past May, we passed a very, very substantial, extremely painful, it has to be said, but structurally important set of Medicaid reforms that will enable us not just to lower our liability this year, but to restrain the growth and cost over time if we implement them correctly. The legislature put in place in 2010 a much more affordable pension system for new employees, but we're working very hard now on reforms beyond that so as to restrain the growth of cost year to year going forward. We can't afford to continue allowing that to grow 20 percent. And we need to overhaul our tax system again to make it more fair, more efficient, and to allow it to grow with the growing economy. If we do those things and maintain discipline on discretionary spending, that's our path out of this trouble. Thank you. Mr. Biss, you have, you, would you answer this question first? Who are your top five contributors? Please identify five organizations which have endorsed your candidacy. Uh, so my top five contributors are, um, I think in order, Stanford Children, the Democratic Party of Illinois, Beverly Rossman, um, I'm leaving out an individual who I'm blanking on right now, but nobody controversial, uh, and the Illinois Venture Capital Association. Um, I'll come back to that when I remember who, who that uh, contributor is. Sure. Um, the organizations that have endorsed me that I'm proudest of are, are across the political spectrum. Uh, Planned Parenthood Illinois Action has endorsed me, as has Personal PAC as the only pro-choice candidate in the race. Uh, the Brady PAC has endorsed me as a strong uh, supporter of sensible gun regulation. The Sierra Club of Illinois and other environmental groups have endorsed me. I also have the endorsement of a number of groups with different perspectives on our state's fiscal issues. The Illinois Federation of Teachers, a teachers union that I'm proud has endorsed me, but I also have the support of the Illinois Chamber of Commerce, the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce, and most recently, the Chicago Tribune. So I'm proud to have support from across the political spectrum from a variety of different actors, most of whom don't always agree with me, but have come to the judgment that I'm at least working hard to find sensible, balanced, sustainable solutions to our state's fiscal problems. Thank you. My largest contributor was auto engineering. Um, I have an individual. Do I have individuals? If there's no other organizations, do I? I mean, do I name individuals, Josie, um, or just you organizations? Can. That's fine. Well, there I mean, was two parts to the question. One is, who are your top five contributors? Okay, auto engineering is a top uh, corporation. Then I have an individual who lives in Glenview, and Peterson. I have Republican Club of Evanston. And I think I have probably a dozen people give me like 100 bucks or 200 bucks each. I'm not sure what that matters. But I think I'm um, also, I don't know, Dan City is the only pro-choice candidate in the, in the race, but I'm also pro-choice, so I don't know how that came about. I think the big things I mentioned in really the public, the corruption and collusion, this is where I really have a problem with Dan's side is he's taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from the Democratic Party and from unions. And he campaigned in his last election that he was going to be a reformer and fight the power in Springfield. Then he took all that money, and I don't see that there was much, much fight there. So, you know, you've got to look at who is funding the individuals, and when you certainly talk about pensions, is it going to be possible for Dan to go into a back room and negotiate with um, the unions and have an arm's length transaction, taking hundreds of thousands of dollars for them? Now, maybe if you're a public sector worker out there, a teacher, you think, well, that's great. You know, we, that's why we gave him the money so that he could advocate for us. Well, how'd that work for you? They've left you holding a bad. They've lied for you for 20 years. As a taxpayer like me, I look at that and say, there's no way that he can advocate on my behalf or your behalf because he's so close to those transactions. So, you know, we've got to ask ourselves, you know, look at the money and find out who, who's going to be a better advocate on your behalf. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Farkas. What in your education and work experience has prepared you to be a state legislator? I'm not sure anything. Now, that <laughs> as I get more and more in this race, I got in very late. Um, someone dropped off the ballot. But as I said, I've I'm, I'm been in the private sector workforce for 20 plus years, most of it on the financial services side. I started off with Shell Oil Company. Um, I started my own business a few years ago. Um, we manage money for individuals, small businesses. I'm very well-versed in 401k plans, as we do. I know pensions. So again, when I look at the issues for Illinois, they're all financial at this point. There's no way of getting around that you can say that we, we can get out of this mess by, by talking about all the satellite issues. You know, we're, the pension fund is 85 to $100 billion underfunded, give or take what day you look at it, and the investment returns. 
Medicaid was $2 billion underfunded last year. It'll be $20 billion, $25 billion in five years. So essentially being an investment and finance person, being on the private sector side of the sphere instead of Dan being on the public sector sphere, I have a different frame of reference. His is purely theoretical and college-based. Mine is private sector-based. I've been on the trenches of the employee at will, no tenure, um, more with less kind of attitude. And I think that's what it's going to take down in Springfield. When you go down to Springfield, I think you're an executive of one of 177 of a $30 billion, uh, $30 billion operation called Illinois Incorporated. I really think it's ex the need is to have private sector business experience to understand how to run a business like Illinois. Mr. Biss. Yes, thank you. Um, my previous job was in, I was a math professor, as was said. I think there's two ways in which that's relevant. First of all, the issues before us now, frankly, are very technical. Uh, the set of analytical skills and the, the pieces of technical facility and knowledge that come with that training are fairly unusual in the legislature, and they've been candidly very helpful to me in working on these issues, particularly on the public pension issue. Second of all, of course, education, both elementary and secondary and higher education, is among the most important things the state does. It's important to our community. It's important to the whole state's economic and social health. I was someone who spent time in the classroom, not only at the college level, but in the high school and middle school level as well prior to that. And so I, I bring to Le Springfield an experience and understanding of our education systems. I want to go back to two other issues, though. First of all, the fifth contributor is Jennifer Staines, a neighbor of mine, very uncontroversial <laughs> again. Uh, and second of all, about uh, financial support. You know, I'm not someone who believes in bashing teachers' unions. And I think that they're sometimes right, and when they're right, I vote their way. They're sometimes wrong, and when they're wrong, I don't vote their way, but I think they're valued partners. But I have to say that in this current election, they're not really supporting me. The Illinois Education Association is the biggest public employee union in the state. They're not supporting me. The American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, the second biggest, is also not supporting me. And that's because of the action that I've taken on public pensions. Now, I look forward to working with them. I don't think it's relevant or helpful or constructive to beat them up. I don't beat them up. But to accuse me of being in their pocket is really quite remarkable, given the realities of my funding in this election. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question is for you, Mr. Biss. How can we ensure that all schools, including charters, are accountable for performance? We have to ensure that all schools, including charters, are accountable for performance is the answer. So first of all, that comes, that begins on the charter subject with making sure that the formats of accountability that come from assessments, that come from other aspects of evaluation the state has put in place in recent years, and we've done a lot on that, by the way, apply equally. They have to apply equally to charters and to non-chartered public schools. The whole purpose of charter schools is supposed to be to create a set of apples to apples, even playing field experiments, where we can try different sorts of educational experiments and see what works best. If you give charters a pass in certain uh, directions, then you've basically invalidated that whole experiment. So I, I support very strongly holding charters to the exact same standards as other public schools when it comes to accountability for outcomes when it comes to graduation rates and uh, matriculation to college, and also when it comes to transparency of how the money is spent. Now, the broader thing to say is that the state of Illinois is making very important progress on these issues. We've passed a series of pieces of legislation in the last few years to really improve the mechanism by which we evaluate our teachers, to improve the mechanism by which we evaluate our schools, hold our principals accountable, as well as our teachers. And this is a very, very important part of the way that we're going to find a mechanism in a time of fiscal constraint to fund the schools that most need the resources to get the job done for students who need it. Thank you. Mr. I would, have, I would actually have to agree with most of what Dan said. You guys shouldn't be surprised. That was actually a very good answer. I would hold the schools, I would hold the schools accountable as well. I don't, I don't know why there should be any discrepancy between the charters and the public schools. I mean, the charters are still public owned, isn't that correct? I mean, they're public owned. I mean, the private schools is a different story, but I'm not so sure why they shouldn't have the same set of criteria. And I'm not an expert in that area, but I'm, I happen to tend to agree that, yeah, we should need to hold them accountable, all those reasons. Okay, thank you. Mr. Farkas, what are your positions on conceal and carry? I believe in the Second Amendment. I think everyone has the right to own a firearm in this country. Um, as far as concealed carry goes, you know, we, we're the only state that doesn't have it, and that includes two other ones, Guam and Puerto Rico. And I'm by no means a firearms expert. I don't own a firearm. Uh, I don't want to intrude on anybody's other right to own a firearm. 
But what I did find out is that you do have two types of concealed carry. There's one that's called a shell issue, where if you pass a test and you have some waiting period, I guess, you get everyone gets it no matter what. There's also something called a May issue, where it gives the state a lot more flexibility in saying, well, okay, you pass the test, but you also have some kind of basic need. I would be more in favor of that. Again, this to me isn't one of those issues that's going to make or break the state. We're not going to collapse here in the next five years if we have too many or too few guns or too many or too few abortions. I mean, those aren't really big topics. Um, I'd sit down in a room with anybody and debate the issues and, and, and try to figure out something that works for all. I'm just afraid that if we don't do something, the courts are going to force it on us anyway. The courts overturned the handgun ban in Chicago and D.C. So what's to think that they won't come in and people file lawsuits the right to carry a gun and use these other 49 states as an example and say, well, okay, that's overturned and now we're forced on something that maybe we didn't negotiate. So I'm open to discussions. I'd like to sit down in a room with rational people, talk to experts, police, fire, um, anybody who, who give me more guidance on the gun issue. But, you know, I'm not safe with everybody walking around with a gun. I know it doesn't make me feel safer. I know we all live in the north suburbs and it's not, you know, I don't feel like I'm going to be shot at any moment, so I don't have to feel like I'm Clint Eastwood packing. Thank you. Mr. Biss. We're pretty accustomed, unfortunately, to seeing lists where Illinois is in the bottom of the 50 states. And I think it's just really a joy to have an issue where we are unquestionably in my view, the best. We're the only state in the country that does not allow the carrying of concealed weapons, and I say thank goodness, and I have fought very hard and successfully so far in Springfield to keep it that way. I think it's the wishes of our community. It's certainly my wish. It's what I think is right for our family and right for our district. And it's very, very much under threat. There have been close votes. There will continue to be close votes, and it's an important issue in this election. And I have to say, in this ninth Senate district, a 14-year-old child was murdered a few weeks ago. And, and child is the only correct word to use. And I spent a lot of my time thinking about pensions and budgets and Medicaid, and God knows that's important. But if we're not prepared to think carefully about these issues that resulted in the death of an innocent 14-year-old in the streets of our district in the last few weeks, I don't know what kind of society we have become and I think it is simply impossible to be an effective and responsible legislator for this district and dismiss that issue as unimportant for the next five years. Thank you. And please answer the next question first. What specifically would you do about the use of assault weapons in Illinois? Well, I, I support a ban on assault weapons in Illinois. Um, and more broadly speaking, one of the constant issues of debate with this subject, which is a difficult and touchy subject, I understand, is the claim, the correct claim, that most of the people who commit gun crimes are criminals and therefore aren't following the law in the first place, and so why worry about it? Why worry about passing a law that restricts the ability of so-called law-abiding citizens to protect themselves without changing the situation for the criminals? The problem is that the majority of crimes are committed with guns that were initially purchased legally. And so if you ban the sale of assault weapons, you cut off the beginning of the supply. Now, will it still be possible for some people to have access to them? Yes, it will. But it will substantially change what's effectively a black market economy for very deadly weapons. And so I strongly support an assault weapon ban. Thank you. Mr. Farkas? Again, not a firearm expert, but I've learned a lot in the last two months. Does everyone here really know what an assault weapon is? Yes. Okay. There's semi-automatic and fully automatic. If you're fully automatic weapon, it's an assault one where you pull the trigger down and it keeps shooting until it runs out of bullets. And a semi-automatic weapon is you have to keep pulling the trigger. So assault weapons are typically those military grade where you hold the trigger down and it just keeps firing until it's done. We've already got a ban here in Illinois assault weapons. So all we're trying to do, I think, is this incrementalism to take guns away from just about everybody. And again, we have the toughest gun laws in the country, and yet we've got more murders down in the city of Chicago than Afghanistan over the last 10 years. So it's not so much about taking these guns away from law-abiding citizens, it's putting the criminals in prison and locking them up for a long time if they're using firearms. Now, tragedy, I didn't hear about the tragedy that Dan is talking about. Nobody wants to see a child killed by a weapon, but we're fooling ourselves, too, to think that just because we ban the guns here in Illinois that they're not going to walk in from some other state. All you're doing is keeping guns out of the hands of illegal laws when you make the laws tougher. The criminals don't follow the rules. <laughs> no matter what rule you make, they're not going to follow them. You know, there are only two people that carry guns right now concealed in Illinois, felons and Chicago aldermen. Did you know that? 
Chicago aldermen are allowed to carry a concealed weapon. So again, there are politicians in this lovely state making rules for themselves that don't apply to everybody else. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Farkas, what additional ethics reforms are needed at the state level? Boy, well, that's a loaded question, a long question. Um, the money corrupts, <laughs> money, absolutely. I, I, I mean, we've got to do, but I have a 10 point plan on my website, and I've got 90 seconds, and this lady's very tight on the timing over here to try and get all these thoughts in. But I mean, I've, <laughs> ethics. Um, how about just campaign, limits on campaign cash to contribute total spend in the district? I mean, I don't know how much Dan's raising, go to followthemoney.org, but it's a lot more than I have. Um, there are people spending millions of dollars on house seats that, what is the salary? I don't even know the salary of this job we're going for, $50,000? So people are willing to throw an awful lot of cash. For what reason? Because they go down to state and they, get, <laughs> they take care of themselves. Um, I offered up, here's a, I'm, I'm a Republican, I don't like a lot of taxes. Has anyone ever offered up a campaign tax? How about we? remove the tax exempt status from all campaign funds and we tax the politicians. They've screwed up the pensions, they've screwed up just about everything else in the state. Why don't we take some of their money back? The, uh, my Republican friends and their incumbents probably don't like that either. You know what, for Dan, he likes progressive taxes. We can even make it progressive. So the more money you have in your campaign fund, we tax it higher. I mean, there's, there's a whole list of things. Um, we can't, but did you ever see Tom Coburn's waste book um, that came out at the federal level? I mean, this guy's a senator from I forget what state, but it, I just highlighted a few. Seven hundred thousand dollar grant the government gave for gave for a musical on global warming. They spent a million dollars to see if a male fruit fly would be more attracted to an older female fruit fly than a younger one, or vice versa. I mean, the stuff blows my mind when I get into this race. I think, what are we doing in government now? City of Chicago already mentioned has. Thank oh, you. did Your I already cut it? Up. I didn't, didn't watch her. Okay, and Mr. Bisk. First of all, I, I strongly support much stronger campaign finance regulation. I support lowering the existing contribution limits. I support closing a loophole that allows legislative leaders like House Speaker and Senate President to give unlimited contributions. I co-sponsored a bill to do that this year. I also support creating a system of public finance. That's the best way to get rid of as much of the corruption in campaign finance as possible. But there's lots more to be done in the state level. Shortly after the grotesque Blagojevich circus, a part of the package of reforms that was passed included substantial changes to our FOIA law, our Freedom of Information Act law, to increase public access to government information, and then also substantial uh, overhaul of our procurement mechanisms to make sure that contracts aren't given out on a no-bid basis and so forth. These were mostly well-intentioned, and I think they were steps in the right direction. But they were done very, very quickly because there was a feeling that we had to do something in the aftermath of, the, of these scandals. And I, I think there are very substantial improvements that could be made both in our FOIA law and in our um, procurement law. Finally, our budget process itself is screwed up. We need to emulate states like Virginia that have a bipartisan, bicameral, academically advised panel that creates a revenue estimate based on actual economic data so that we can then live by that as budget makers. And we need to put in place some, some form of accrual accounting so we can't just push obligations like pension and retiree health obligations onto future generations willy-nilly. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Biss, do you support the states giving a favorable treatment to the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Sears, and other businesses that threaten to leave the state? Well, I'll tell you, I voted for that bill. Uh, I struggled a lot with it, and to be perfectly blunt, I'm not sure if I did the right thing. Uh, it, as a matter of principle, I'm very opposed to that kind of stuff. As a matter of principle, it's an opportunity for corruption, and it's an opportunity for political deal-making. But I, I took that vote, so let me, let me explain it to you. The vote, at the end of the day, made sense to me on two bases. Uh, first of all, if you look at corporations that are headquartered in Illinois that have a national or international presence, they are taxed based upon uh, the sales that they have and the profits they have in Illinois. CME is the only large international company headquartered in Illinois 
that for essentially technical reasons, because their, their trades are all cleared in a computer that's based in Illinois, their entire global revenue counted toward their corporate income tax. And so they themselves were actually paying a very large percentage of our entire corporate income tax. And it, it seemed to not quite, not quite be, be rational. And then for the same, by the same token, they're a fundamentally extremely mobile business and one that's really an anchor for a big chunk of economic growth in Illinois. So I, I did reluctantly take that vote. As a matter of economic policy, the best way to handle this issue is to create a climate that's, first of all, entirely equitable across the economic board, and second of all, favorable enough to everybody that these kind of deals don't need to get struck. Thank you. Mr. Farkas. Well, this is a big one. I said at my opening that we need to promote private sector business growth here. So we've created a problem. You know, in, in the federal government, you know, business, I don't think any of us are really planning to leave the United States. If things get bad, we'll probably stay here. But Illinois is not an island. We have competitors around us. We have Indiana doing a lot of great things. We have Wisconsin. We have Tennessee, Texas, all these other states that are doing things that are more business friendly. So we've backed ourselves in a corner because, again, political corruption, collusion. We've raised taxes on businesses. They have alternatives. So when the, we get back to the bill that you're talking about that I think Dan said he voted for, is you have to allow businesses to negotiate with the state. You know, they have the right to challenge property taxes or challenge the taxes they're getting. We just have to have maybe better negotiators on the state side. You know, I mean, every, every business should have the right to challenge these uh, issues, but we're so bad and we're in such a desperate position and our backs are to the wall. These companies know that. So now they can come in and name their price to get us to stay. See, you know, Sears did that, CME, like you saw, he's done, doing that. So we are just put ourselves in such a bad situation and the continually bad decisions, raising taxes, forcing more businesses out, that now we're, we're negotiating from a poor position. So yes, we have to keep doing it, but we have to be more selective about when we do it. We just have to get better people on our side to negotiate better deals. Thank you. Mr. Farkas, regarding the public pension system, which reforms are needed? What are the top two or three changes you would like to see? Well, Josie, there aren't just two or three. I mean, again, this is my business. I'm in 401k and pensions, and so I've spent a lot of time here. If there are public sector workers in room teachers, I apologize for the mess that's happened over the last 20, 25 years. I mean, it's kind of hard to manage a pension plan when you don't fund it. Now, certainly the benefits that were given along the way and those increases in benefits didn't make it any easier and certainly made, lend it to the underfunding. But you've got to do a several steps. One. You've got to take away the guarantee. I'm sorry, but I don't have a pension. Probably most of you in the room don't have a pension or a guarantee to pay you in retirement. So we start with 401k plans for the, for the people who are in the plan or new employees. It's not fair to new employees either to force them to put their money in a pot that's $100 billion underfunded. You wonder why we're not getting good teachers and young teachers? They don't want to be a part of that mess. For people on the back end who are already in retirement, the COLAs have to be adjusted to something more based on economic reality. 3% compounded COLAs are not going to cannot maintain. That's taking up 25% of the cost right now. Tie it to investment returns of the fund. Tie it to um, CPI. Everybody in the middle who's already in five to 20 years, we're going to have to make painful decisions about how the benefits get cut. But one thing I've said repeatedly, the politicians have to go first. Eliminate their pensions. Make them take cuts because it's not fair to the public sector workers to go first. The politicians have no credibility on this issue, and they will never have it, and you'll never get the public sector workers to make any changes until the politicians go first. Thank you. Mr. Biss? We need to do three things. First of all, we need to make a series of reforms to the package of benefits that enable the growth of the cost year to year to be roughly comparable to economic growth. Like I said, from 2012 to 2013, our payment went up 20 percent. That's unmanageable. We have to reform the system to change that. Second of all, we have to put in place a mechanism to enforce the state pay its share going forward. The largest part of the problem today is because the state just didn't pay what it was supposed to, not for a couple years, not for a couple decades, since the Korean War, we have to fix that. And third of all, going forward for new employees, we have to put in place some kind of mechanism that shares the risk between the employee and the employer, so that on the one hand, the employee is guaranteed a minimum benefit. We're talking about a population here that does not qualify for Social Security. And so if we were to take away any form of minimum benefit, this would be the only population in the whole country, Illinois teachers, who didn't have some safety net to rely upon. I don't think that's a good way to encourage people to go into the profession. But we also have to shelter the state from the risk. So what I've put forth, which has become a part of the plan that's currently on the table, is a cash balance system for new employees that accomplishes those goals 
provides the employees a minimum benefit, but also shares the risk between the employer and shelters the state. What Mr. Farkas is proposing is to go to a pure 401k system. That was tried by a number of states. It did not work. West Virginia went back. Nebraska went back to a cash balance plan. And all the forward-looking states today, Rhode Island, Utah, Louisiana, Kansas, that are looking forward on cutting-edge pension reforms are going to some kind of risk-sharing system like what I have designed. Thank you. OK, and um, Mr. Biss. A number of states have made changes in their voting procedures requiring voters to present a state-issued photo identification in the polling place. What are your views on this requirement? My views is that this is a terrible idea. So l let us understand what this is about. There are some people who say there's a lot of voter fraud out there, and we've got to stop it by making people show an ID at the polls. OK, great idea. Let's analyze it. How much voter fraud is there? None. The amount of voter fraud that has been caught is minuscule. We're talking about one or two examples per year at the most. But if you put in place a voter ID requirement, what does that mean? It's harder for low-income people to vote. It's harder for minorities to vote. It's harder for people who don't speak English as their first language to vote. How much of a problem do we have of low-income people, minorities, and people who don't speak English as their first language not voting enough? A huge problem. So this is an alleged solution to a non-problem that enormously exacerbates a real and huge problem. It's a terrible idea. It's obviously politically motivated, and we need to put a stop to it. Fortunately, we have not seen any significant movement in this direction in Illinois, and I'm going to fight to continue making that the case. Well, we're going to disagree really heavily on this one. The, pr the problem with common sense down in <clears throat> Springfield is just not that common. Um, what is the problem with the voter ID? We show IDs to go in buildings. We show IDs for just about everything. And if it's a problem with the low income side, we'll give them to you for free. We're trying to protect the integrity of the voting process. And I don't buy, especially in Illinois, that there's no voter fraud. Does anyone raise your hand if you don't think there's any voter fraud in Illinois? None, zero. Zero? Wow. Well, you, well <laughs> I don't buy that. I don't think most people buy that across the country. We're not known for Crook County for nothing in this in the state. So I don't see that's a particular hardship to get people a photo ID paid for by the government, whatever we have to do to maintain the integrity. People have, low-income people have cell phones, low-income people do a lot of things, and I think to protect the integrity of the voting process to ensure that there's no continued voter fraud, that a voter ID would be a wise thing to do. Thank you. And Mr. Farkas, would a reduction in the number of local governments improve the economic condition of the state? Please explain. I think we have something like 7,000 local taxing bodies, or close to 7,000. Police, fire, school district here, school district there. The second highest state, I think, is Pennsylvania with around 4,000. Again, I'm in the private sector in the business world, and when things aren't working and you have far-flung operations divisions, the first thing you normally do is you consolidate. I don't see why we couldn't get economies of scale by consolidating some of the taxing bodies within the state. I don't think that's irrational or unreasonable. Now, I know these different taxing bodies would fight it. I've talked to the Glenview Park District people, and I've talked to others. Everybody wants to maintain their little fiefdom. No, don't take my budget away. I know in Glenview, we've got District 225. We've got District 234 for schools. We've got this through. You know, I think the, I, I'm pretty sure exactly. The Chicago Archdiocese has something, a couple hundred schools, and they have one superintendent. And those schools work very well. I don't see the need or to have so many different taxing bodies, especially at a time where we're losing money. Consolidation would serve us, save us some money, and I think it would benefit and streamline and get us more efficient. Thank you. Mr. Biss? It's absolutely true. We have just shy of 7,000 units of government. We're number one by far. I think that's maybe a, a less exciting statistic to be proud of than our concealed carry stat. And there's a growing body of research that shows this is not the optimal way to do government. First of all, the efficiency is certainly correct. There's no question that if you consolidate in areas where there is bureaucratic or administrative redundancy, you save money. And that's already important. But it's also about service delivery. There are literally thousands of different units of government in the Chicago region that oversee some aspect of transportation, roads or trains or buses or bridges. And this is one of the most important economic engines of our region, is our transportation infrastructure. It's impossible to have coordinated planning when there's 2,000 different decision makers. 
So smart consolidation can have the opportunity to both create smarter, more effective planning and actual simply numerically lower costs. Uh, there are two different kinds of government that people talk about. One is the general purpose government, like townships and counties and municipalities and so forth. They do all sorts of stuff. We're number one in the country at having those. We've got more than anybody else. Then there's the special purpose, parks, libraries, mosquito abatement districts, schools. And we're also number one there. And so there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, both for collapsing some of the uh, geographic redundancy so as to make coordination easier and collapsing some of the vertical uh, redundancy so as to make things cheaper. Thank you. Mr. Biss, what do you think is a fair distribution of the tax burden between individuals and business and corporations and why? It's a great question. Um, the Illinois Constitution mandates that the corporate tax rate be at most eight-fifths the personal income tax rate. I have no idea where that comes from. What I know for sure is that we don't have a fair system right now. We don't have a fair personal income tax system because we have a constitutional mandate that it be flat, which ties the hands of the legislature for making good tax policy and creates an income tax system that, again, does not grow with the economy. And we have an absolutely rotten corporate income tax system that is riddled with loopholes, has an extremely high rate. And I, I will say I agree with the right on this, that the high numerical corporate income tax rate is not good for the business climate. But I don't think that means that we should throw out the corporate tax. I think we have room to raise as much revenue as we do by dropping that rate, getting rid of a number of loopholes. The income tax code in Illinois is regressive. It hits the lowest quintile by far the hardest, the next lowest quinti income quintile the next hardest, and so forth. And that needs to be fixed. And it needs to be fixed by making a fair corporate income tax code. It needs to be fixed certainly by having a progressive income tax. At the end of the day, where the balance will be between personal and corporate, I can't say in a simple numerical way, but the balance is certainly out of whack today. Thank you. I think, the, sorry, I think the flat tax that we have in Illinois and mandated by the council is one thing that we do get right here in Illinois. I mean, I look at things, if, if we want to have two tax rates, I'd be okay with zero for everybody not making any money up to maybe, I don't know, the poverty level. And everybody over that with a flat income tax rate. Does everybody understand letting the government decide what fair is, is, is really not, I don't think, prudent? If someone's making $500,000 a year and someone's making $50,000 a year, it doesn't matter what flat tax we put on that, the person making $500,000 a year pays 10 times the amount of tax to the federal government or to the state government or the federal government. I know in my business, I tax or I tax, I charge my clients based on a fee of assets. The larger my client accounts go, I, I actually reduce the rate. I reduce the rate because I know I'm, I'm putting dollars in my bank account, I'm not putting rates. If the state would get more uh, embrace private sector and, and respect those dollars that the companies are bringing to them or the individuals that make a lot of money, they're still bringing you lots of dollars. Now, Dan will say the selective reasoning, well, Illinois gets it right, 49 states have a concealed carry, um, no uh, concealed carry law and they're wrong, but yet um, 34 states have a progressive income tax, um, so they're, they're right. It's just, I mean, he's selective perception of what he's saying about using these numbers between who has progressive and who has uh, concealed carry. So I'm a big believer in flatter is fair, take care of the poor, give them no rate up into a certain amount. But progressive income tax is just really to me is a jealousy tax. And it just gives the government more money to spend and they don't necessarily do a good job with it. Thank you, Mr. Farkas. Would you support a state tax on bullets similar to the one recently proposed in Cook County? Here's another one of those things. I mean, there are taxes all over the place. Now, I, again, I guess it goes back to the business question. We're so desperate here. We're so out of money that the knee-jerk reaction is always, let's, what else can we tax? Five cents a bullet. How about tax haircuts? How about tax soda? 30, let's take the soda tax. I mean, every time we tax something new, there just seems, doesn't seem to be a recognition that it's not necessarily the revenue that's the problem in the state, $30 billion plus. We can't get control on the spending. Illinois is really a microcosm of the rest of the country. We tax too much, we spend too much, we borrow too much. And there doesn't seem to ever be a recognition about cutting expenses. I know it's painful, but the politicians in this state have done a very bad job of managing the money they have. I gave you that stats, even the federal government, of what people are spending money on. To me, it's the height of audacity, really, to keep asking for more money when the state 
is blowing money and such frivolous things and they can't balance the budget they have, but then come back to us, come back to me, come back to all of you and say, well, I'm sorry we screwed it up again. Can we have some more money? Or not can we have some more money. We're raising your taxes again or we're putting a bullet tax. I wouldn't support any of these taxes right now, even some that may make sense, only because we haven't fixed the core problem in the state and really in the country. Thank you. Mr. Biss? The Medicaid reform package that we put through in May incorporated a $1 per pack cigarette tax. The reasoning was to produce a balanced approach to dealing with this Medicaid funding crisis. We needed to make substantial cuts, but also find revenues. And let's find revenues from a place that simultaneously discourages activities that drive up the costs, namely smoking. Given the fiscal constraints that our public safety system is under, I think it makes sense to look at a bullet tax. It's something I'd be very happy to consider. I want to go back quickly to this progressive tax issue, though. Um, I did hear you say that you think there should be a regressive income tax. And if we want to do that, then we'll also have to change the Constitution. So I hope we could at least work together on that constitutional change. I don't support a progressive income tax because of the 43 states that have an income tax, 35 of them have a progressive income tax. I support a progressive income tax because it makes good sense. Some of the arguments against have said, oh, this is going to lead to economic ruin. This is going to lead to a very, very high tax, high debt environment like, let's say, New York or California. And the truth of the matter is that states like North Dakota and Alabama and Mississippi all have progressive income taxes as well. It's something which exists across the political spectrum and across the country. Maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's a bad idea. Let's debate it. But there doesn't seem to be an ideological tinge to the countries that have one. For example, one of the eight flat tax states is Massachusetts. Thank you. Mr. Biss, there are currently no state restrictions on fracking. Would you support the bill to delay fracking in, in Illinois until the adverse effects are better understood? In fact, I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. Uh, fracking is a really remarkable change in our energy environment uh, in the country. And it, it actually does present potentially real benefit. But it's also potentially enormously dangerous. And the nature of those dangers is that they could be felt in our water supply and in other public health regards for literally many, many generations. So we have to be careful. And fracking has come to Illinois a little bit more slowly than some states. If you look at a state like New York that, that began this discussion really carefully about four years ago and tried to resolve it at the local level and found different counties doing different things, they've just found they're not sure how to do this safely yet. And we need to. So I'm a proud co-sponsor of the bill to delay the onset of fracking until we've figured out an appropriate regulatory regime. And I'm going to work hard to find that appropriate regulatory regime, because if we do get it right, it has great opportunities. But no way should we start until we're sure we can do it right. Thank you. I haven't been in the Illinois legislature for a few years. I haven't seen the bill. Um, I don't know for sure if it's right or wrong. I'd, I'd want to do the, see the research. I'm all for protecting the environment wherever we can. But I also know we do have energy shortage problems in this country. We need to sort of get ourselves toward energy dependence. Fracking sounds like a great way to expose um, natural gas we couldn't get to before, maybe oil as well. Again, I'm not an engineering expert, but certainly I would want to see the research. I would want to make an educated decision about balancing the cost benefit to the environment versus the cost and the benefit uh, for providing new energy for all of us. I'm not one who wants to see us fighting wars every five, ten years because we have to keep going to the Middle East to get oil and other energy systems. So uh, I'd be in favor of taking a look at the bill, reading it. I haven't read it. I'm sure Dan's read it up and down because he's been in the legislature. But again, I would look at it from a business perspective and try to balance the cost benefit for everybody. Thank you, Mr. Parkas. This question is for you to answer first. What sex education do you think students in our school should have? What contraceptive and abortion services should be available? How should these be funded? Wow. Um, what? Go start it slow with the first one. OK. What sex education do you think students in our schools in should what, have? What grade are we starting at? They don't say here, Here's so. That's my decision. <laughs> well, Boy, I'm less, I'm less <laughs> an expert on this than I was on fracking. <laughs> so, so can we go back to that question? Uh, <laughs> um, I have a fourth and fifth grader, too, so this is really scary for me to talk about. Um, I think when I, if I can remember when I was in elementary school, we got something in fifth grade. I think it's about the right time to start. Um, what should we cover as well? Go, go over the question. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll say it one more time here. 
What sex education do you think students in our school should have? Okay. What contraceptive and abortion services should be available? Okay. How okay. should these be funded? Okay, the sex education, whatever to deem necessary at the educational level, I'm not a very stickler on that. What abortion services should we need at a school? Um, I know my daughter or my son can't get an aspirin at school without calling home. So I know there's been a lot of things saying about where you have to, you know, you can provide these, you don't have to tell the parents. So no, I'm not in favor for that. Um, providing it at school, I, you know, I, I'm not an expert on this issue, but I, I would say, you know, start the education, sex education early. It's better to educate them than not. I mean, they can, you can get, some, you know, get away from some of the problems later. I'm not a real big fan of having it available so much at the school um, without my knowledge, but certainly I'm smart enough to know things go on beyond my, <laughs> beyond my uh, knowledge too behind, with kids. So um, that wasn't a very great co coherent answer, but... Um, and how that, should they be funded? How they should be funded. It's already funded with our tax dollars already, I guess, the, uh, board, or the um, uh, sex education school. So yeah, I guess state funded and private if you want to. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Biss? Well, I'm, I'm proud to be the endorsed candidate of Planned Parenthood and Illinois Action and personal PAC in this race. And part of that is because of my strong support and co-sponsorship of a bill that we worked on and weren't able to pass regarding comprehensive age-appropriate sex education in public schools in Illinois. This is one of these things that if you believe in research at all, there's just not a question. It's good for public health. It's good in preventing unwanted pregnancies and indeed in preventing abortions. It's really something that is unquestionably, if you believe the research, a good thing to do for our young people. Unfortunately, it becomes a politicized issue and we need people in the legislature who are willing to fight hard for it because we understand the benefits of it. Um, regarding contraception and abortion, I'm 100% I'm pro-choice and there have been attacks on a woman's right to choose, even in Illinois in the legislature. We read about Virginia and transvaginal ultrasounds and Michigan, and we think that wouldn't happen here, but it could happen here, and there were bills involving ultrasound mandates and other really dangerous restrictions against a woman's right to choose that we, I was at the forefront of fighting, not just voting the right way, but speaking against, advocating with my colleagues, sitting on conference calls, and figuring out what the next step was to make sure that we killed these things, which we have done, but we're gonna have to keep on working to do it. Regarding funding, to me, this is a health care issue, and there doesn't need to be a segregation between one type of health care and another type of health care. I think it's a mistake that on the federal level we have that segregation today. Thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Biss. If new or increased taxes are out of the question, what services do you believe the state should abandon and why? The current budget we have is running a surplus. We're going to pay down over a billion dollars of debt this year. So without new taxes, we should be fine, right? Well, the problem, of course, is that that balance doesn't talk about our long-term liabilities. And that's why both of us agree and keep coming back to this pension issue. Our state's fiscal crisis relies upon a resolution of the pension issue if we want to get out of this. We can live with our current annual payment into the pension system just growing naturally with the economy. We can't live with it growing from $4.9 billion in fiscal year 2012 to $5.7 billion in fiscal year 2013 if that growth continues 20% year after year after year. So the, the, key, the key steps that are needed are to bring that pension growth under control, to implement our Medicaid reforms so that that growth also stays under control and to have a comprehensive overhaul to our tax codes so that our tax system grows with the economy as opposed to growing slower than the economy as it has. But if you do that and then continue vigilance on discretionary spendings, the, the key aspect of the fiscal recovery is not going to be a series of continued very, very deep cuts. It's going to be these structural reforms to make the curves bend in the right direction going forward. Uh, to be truthful, we've cut so deeply recently that there aren't big pots of money left that could be cut reasonably. <clears throat> Thank well, you. Keep in mind, I'm sure everybody knows here, we raised personal income taxes almost 70% a year ago, year and a half ago, and we raised corporate income taxes about 50% at the same time. So 
there's no appetite for more taxes right now. The onus is on the, the legislature to make some cuts. Again, I go back to Illinois is not an island. We can't operate like people won't leave. We've lost 800,000 or so based on the Illinois Policy Institute report over the last 15 years. It comes down to one every 10 minutes. So people will leave if the alternatives are better. So at this point, we are not in a situation where we could even think about raising taxes. So it goes to what Dan said, what I said earlier. So now we have to take a deep dive forensic look at the, at the budget and the books and figure out where we're going to make cuts. Pensions and Medicaid are the two biggest drivers, so obviously you start there, right? That's the biggest hole, and those are the biggest bang for the buck. But we've also got a long list of programs that we're funding at the state level um, that just keep getting funded, keep getting funded. They're under $5 million, so we just keep funding. We've got to look through all of these. And I'd say we're not going to single out any one of them, but we've got to look at these numbers and see if we can afford to pay them. Now, certainly we want to have money available for all the social programs we need. We need safety nets here, but we have to not make them safety hammocks, as you've heard before. We have to look at all the different items of the budget, figure out where we can make substantive cuts, and get back to a healthy um, budget. Okay, thank you. That is the end of our question and answer period. And now I would like you to make your closing statements. And since, Mr. Biss, you made the first opening statement, Mr. Farkas, if you could make the first closing statement. As I've discussed, uh, discussed um, early in this, in this debate is that I'm in this for all the right reasons. I'm a concerned citizen frustrated with where the government's going. I could no longer sit, sit idle and not do anything. Uh, I've got years of business experience. I think it's exactly what we need down in Springfield right now to, to help solve these budget issues. And it's going to be very difficult. I don't relish the thought of going down to Springfield, leaving my family. In fact, the other day, my kids looked at me, and after I told them I might have to go down there five months, and they said, well, we really kind of hope Dan Biss wins. And I, I, I about grounded them for two months, because they know all the free time that I've been spending with them over the last five years. I know it's a big, uh, a big deal. So I just want all of you to know I think there are those key issues important here. I don't throw out the, the, the public corruption. I think we can't get anywhere in the state if we don't get a handle on that, because if we don't figure out the right leadership, none of the other stuff matters. And I thought what was really telling the other day is uh, the Tennessean newspaper, which is a very liberal newspaper, has not endorsed a Republican since 1972. They came out and endorsed Mitt Romney, and, and the title on the thing was Hell Freezes Over. Tennessean newspaper endorses Mitt Romney. So if they can do it in this democratic state of democratic states can endorse, endorse a Republican candidate for president, all of you that I know there were a lot of hands went up before, that I know there's a lot of Democratic voters in the room, you can vote for Republican. You can do it here, help balance the state budget. You just don't have to tell your really liberal friends about it. You can do it. <laughs> hey, thank you. And Mr. Biss. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention, your interest in this race, and the really good questions that were very impressive in their depth and, and in their diversity. I've been in the legislature for almost two years, and it's not been easy. We're faced with a series of very, very difficult choices. And there have been times when I've had to push the green button on my desk to move forward a piece of reform, for instance, on Medicaid, that it was very painful because the choices that are before us are painful. Here's what I hope I have offered you. Straightforward honesty about what the choices are. I'm not going to pretend that a unicorn can ride in with pixie dust and make the problems go away. I'm going to talk about the most difficult to address and the most painful to change structural parts of our state budget, our pension, our Medicaid systems. I'm going to talk about our tax code. In an affluent North Shore district, I'm going to talk about our tax code because we cannot keep on, as a state, pretending that the problems are something they're not. The problems are about our expectations for government services and our willingness to pay taxes. And we have to be dead serious and honest with ourselves about what the choices are. So I probably haven't made all the right choices, but I believe I've made a lot of the right choices. And I've appreciated the remarkable input and conversation that we've had as I've had the choices before me. I ask for your vote today to have the opportunity to move forward for two more years and work with you to continue making the right, albeit difficult, choices. Because I know that if we get this stuff right, the kind of prosperity, the just society, the economic growth, and the opportunity for all that awaits us is a real treasure that's worth sacrificing for today. Thank you for your attention, and I hope I've earned your vote. <clears throat> Thank you.
thank you, Mr. Biss and Mr. Fargus, uh, for participating in this debate and giving the public an opportunity to hear you discuss the issues. You did a great job answering all these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.